Good morning. One of the greatest blessings of conferences like this one is that it brings the welcome opportunity to come together with colleagues whose work we have long admired, but whom we have never had the opportunity to meet before. My blessing is twofold in chairing this session in that it brings me the opportunity to meet both Aneta Alexandridis and Patricia Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this um, introduction and for having invited me. And I'm very glad to not only be here, but to share the panel with another Cornelian. So it's a little bit of a, uh, how can I say, local fin uh, experience for us in the big city here. Are animals naked? A view from Greek art. Stepping out of his shower, naked, Jacques Derrida famously felt a certain unease when being looked at by his cat. As he describes it himself in The Animal That, I, that Therefore I Am, More to Follow, quote, I have trouble repressing a reflex of shame, end quote. The malaise, however, derives from an anthropocentric and anthropomorphizing view of the animal. After all, quote, it is generally thought that the property unique to animals, what in the last instance distinguishes them from man, is their being naked without knowing it. Not being naked, therefore, not having knowledge of their nudity, in short, without consciousness of good and evil. From that point on, naked without knowing it, animals would not be, in truth, naked. They wouldn't be naked because they are naked. In principle, with the exception of man, no animal has ever thought to dress itself. Clothing would be proper to man, one of the properties of man. Dressing oneself would be inseparable from all the other figures of what is proper to man, even if one talks about it less than speech or reason, the logos, history, laughing, mourning, burial, the gift, etc. The animal, therefore, is not naked because it is naked. It doesn't feel its own nudity. There is no nudity in nature." End quote. So, so far, Derrida. Dressing oneself, if we follow Derrida, would fit into the series of those anthropocentric, reductive, and ultimately repressing categories that distinguished man from animal according to the Greeks and their Western followers. Animals instead, as he would argue, Animals, certainly not the animal, but animals, do not help to define the human and its superiority, but in their diversity stand outside and are independent of categories with which humans try to define themselves. And yet, they make one uncomfortably aware that the lines are not so clearly drawn. After all, why would one feel uneasy when being looked at naked by one's own cat? I see another ancient tradition come through here, namely the tendency to anthropomorphize the animal. The question of my talk, are animals naked, deliberately follows both of these traditions, anthropocentrism and anthropomorphization. It is, as one could legitimately claim, fundamentally wrong or inappropriate for thinking about animals. So why start out with that question that is misdirected? First of all, I'm less interested in the problem as such, but approach it as a historian, particular historian of ancient Greek visual culture, and I want to see what the Greeks made of it. Second, I am actually interested in the question as such, and Greek art shows how complicated it is to come up with an answer because it plays with all the interstices that defy classification. Anthropocentrism and anthropomorphization are related, if not two sides of the same coin. From a cognitive and epistemological point of view, as Lauren Dustin and Greg Mitman have emphasized, there is no alternative to anthropomorphization. We simply cannot do without it if we try to understand animals, that is, make them intelligible to us. In a similar vein, it seems to me impossible to get rid of anthropocentrism not in the sense that humans are superior to all other forms of being, but in the sense that we cannot describe those beings other than in relation to ourselves. 
Simultaneously, both anthropocentrism and anthropomorphization have the potential to overcome or question the ways of classification and description they rely on. In the following, I would like to tease out some of the visual moments in which both methods and modes of thinking implode. Greek art seems to me particularly promising for this exercise. Unlike in Judeo-Christian tradition, or unlike in the situation portrayed by Derrida, the unclothed body in Greek society is not a priori a matter of unease or shame. Quite to the contrary, nudity, more specifically public nudity in ancient Greece with its gymnasium culture, functioned as a very particular social norm for a specific group of people, the male adult Greek citizen. That did not exclude that the unclothed body could have other, even opposing meanings, depending on gender, age, ethnicity, and the circumstance in which one appeared naked. But it nevertheless visually defined the male citizen and was even constitutive for the Greek idea of the body itself. The prominence of the naked body in Greek visual imagery, in private and in public, confirms the normative power of this body concept, which is simultaneously perpetuated by its representation in Greek art. However, images follow their own rules, and these are not necessarily bound to the rules of reality or abstract thinking. And yet, they maintain coherence and inner logic. This way, they make us aware of slippages and gray zones in the Greek anthropomorphizing and anthropocentric system, and ultimately reveal its contradictions and limits. Pictures, therefore, seem to me particularly appropriate to address a flawed question, such as the one I'm posing. In the following, I will explore the role of nudity in visually defining animals or animal bodies in relation or as opposed to humans or human bodies. My paper is organized in five parts. Although my focus is on visual material, I re devote the first section to a seminal text on human and animal bodies with and without clothes, the myth told by Protagoras in Plato's homonymous dialogue. It provides the touchstones for the following analysis of images. In part two, I will give a short reminder of how different figures of the other, excluding animals, are represented in Greek visual tradition, namely as clothed. Part three looks at animals or mixed creatures in human clothing. Part four, skin, looks at the outside of animal and human bodies. Can we make out the physical boundary between the body and what covers it? And the fifth and final part on shame, that is the moral side of being undressed asks whether animals are naked or whether they can be nude. In all parts, immediate and metaphorical meaning of nakedness and nudity interact to various degrees. The visual material I rely on are sculptures and vase paintings from the 6th and the 5th centuries BCE due to the nature of the Athens emphasis lies on Athens. Although there are, no, there are changes over time in the visual repertoire I cover, I do not offer a systematic or chronological overview but rather pick out particular examples that can help illuminate the complexity of the problem. For the analysis of animal bodies, I use non-mythological and mythological imagery. Hybrid figures, such as mixed creatures or transformed humans, seem to me to be at the center of the question as a product or a materialization of anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism that simultaneously has the potential to thwart both modes of thinking. Before I continue, to, uh, some terminolog terminological clarification is needed. Animals, if I say animals, I mean uh, here mostly mammals. And naked, the term naked uh, is also flawed. Modern scholars differentiate between the terms naked and nude. Nakedness, according to Kenneth Clark, quote, is a mark of material reality, whereas nudity transcends that historical and social existence and is a kind of cultural disguise. End quote. In the same vein, Larissa Bonfante, in a seminal article from 1981, calls nudity a costume. I would like to emphasize, however, that in the Greek context, it makes sense to distinguish between nakedness as a morally inferior and nudity as morally superior. Nakedness is therefore equally a costume in that it conveys a specific set of cultural meanings. In Greek depictions of undressed creatures, however, it is not always easy to distinguish material reality or actuality and ideal or cultural disguise. At times, I will therefore use the terms naked and nude synonymously. Another question is when we should designate the depiction of a human body as naked or dressed. 
Scholars of ancient art usually describe a body as naked not only when it is totally deprived of clothing, but also when most of its parts, and especially genitals or buttocks, are exposed. The line is sometimes difficult to draw, but the ambivalence is inherent in Greek language itself. The term gymnos can describe somebody as totally or partially naked, and I stay with the fluid notion of the term. So finally, the first part of my paper, Are Animals Naked? The Philosopher's View. In the myth of the creation told by Protagoras in Plato's dialogue, the philosopher describes how Epimetheus is in charge of equipping the newly created species, animals and humans. We see him busily engaged in distributing physical qualities among the animals, trying to be as fair and well-balanced as possible. Quote, and when he, he had provided against their destruction by one another, he contrived also a means of protecting them against the seasons of heaven. Clothing, that's what the translation says, the Greek term is emechanato, so he procuring them with close hair, pyknais de trixin, and thick skins, stereois dermasin, sufficient to defend them against the winter cold and able to resist the summer heat, so that they might have a natural bed of their own, stromne o kea tekai autophies, when they wanted to rest. Also, he furnished them with hoofs and hair and hard and callous skins under their feet." Unquote. But who wonders, the assiduous Epimetheus completely forgot about man. And so when Prometheus came to inspect the distribution, he found that the other animals were suitably furnished, but that man alone was naked and shoeless and had neither bear nor arms of defense. Gymnon, anipodeton, astroton, aoplon. In short, while man is, naked by, is by nature naked and unprotected, animals are by nature equipped with some sort of clothing as protection. Everything that covers their skin constitutes their natural dress, as it were. To hair for their body, Aristotle, who gives a similar account in his parts of animals, will add feathers, horny scales, etc. All this serves to protect the animals from the inconveniences of their environment, the weather, the hard soil, or enemies. Man, however, while unprotected in the first place, makes up, thanks to divine intervention and technology. The prior disadvantage turns into a prime moment of man's superiority. After Prometheus had provided fire to humankind, the story continues, man, quote, also constructed houses and clothes and shoes and beds. End quote. In fact, he not only catches up with animals, but he in the end surpasses them by his technological skills. Unlike animals, man is able to produce his own dress. Moreover, he's also more flexible in creating different clothing according to his needs. And finally, he is free to put it on and to remove it. Animals instead are doomed to be clothed. As Aristotle points out, they could have just one method of defense and cannot change it for another. They are forced to sleep and perform all their actions with their shoes on the whole time. Hypodedemenon ae, as one might say. They can never take off this defensive equipment of theirs, nor can they change their weapon, whatever it might be. For man, on the other hand, many means of defense are available, and he can change them at any time, and above he can choose what weapon he will have and where. Once man is able to produce all kinds of protective envelopes, so garments, weapons, houses, etc., which establishes his technological superiority over animals, he is still threatened by animals' physical strength unless he lives in a political community. Again, he is supported by the gods. As Protagoras relates, Zeus feared that the entire race would be exterminated, and so he sent Hermes to them, bearing reverence and justice to be the ordering principles of cities and the bonds of friendship and conciliation. Thus man gets to know reverence and justice, idos and decay. The term idos in this context primarily refers to reverence towards the gods and the community, but it also includes the idea of appropriate behavior and shame when applied to the body, a point we will deal with in the last part of this paper. In sum, according to Protagoras and Aristotle, clothing marks what has been called the anthropological difference, but not in the sense that animals are naked because they are uncivilized, no. Because they are uncivilized, that is, because they lack the skills to provide for themselves, 
animals are clothed. That leads us to the second part of my paper, representations of the other. The figure of the animal as an other has a long tradition in Greek thought. Uh, you I probably all know this quote, Diogenes Laertius attributed to either Thales or Socrates, the famous quote that the philosopher was grateful to the gods for three reasons. First, that he was born a human being, not an animal. Second, a man and not a woman. And third, a Greek and not a barbarian. This statement is emblematic of the anthropo andro and, of course, Hellenocentrism of Greek culture. It posits an analogy between animal, woman, and barbarian as opposed to the normative figure of the Greek male citizen, sole bearer of logos. The analogy, however, seems to leak, if not to implode upon closer examination. Are barbarians and women not human beings? I mean, even if some of the ancients considered women another race, they did not necessarily consider them animals. Do animal and barbarian societies not know male and female, etc.? But while it is clear that these analogies ultimately are at least questionable or incongruent, in Greek imagination, animals, women, and barbarian, all, barbarians all shared one basic characteristic, the lack of logos, that is reason, speech, and especially public speech. And there seems to be a visual equivalent to this distinction. Nudity, it seems, can be considered the visual equivalent to logos, whereas being covered by garments defines those who are lacking logos. Let me remind you some of the standard examples in a short survey. To appear nude in public was considered appropriate only for the Greek male citizen in specific contexts, such as athletic games or the gymnasium, eventually the symposium. It is this athletic nudity, originally a status marker of the aristocracy, which is depicted in statues such as the archaic kuro that, he, kuro that you see here on the left and in the center, and then together with a uh, classical nude bronze, probably the statue of a heroic figure. Nudity here is a sign of physical strength, but also of beauty, eventually youth, and the homoerotic body. Women, in contrast, such as seen in these chori from Athens, Attica, and Samos, were always represented dressed in a public context. Barbarians also appeared covered. Scythians and Persians, barbarians by excellence, wear suits covering the whole body, such as the so-called prince of the pediment of the temple of Athena Alphaya in Aegina. I show it here in the polychrome reconstruction by Ulrich and Vincent Brinkmann. The transgressive nature of warrior women, such as the Amazons, is visualized in different ways. They appear as women in male armor or in complete bodysuits similar to Eastern barbarians. So here on the left, uh, as seen with Heracles in an Amazonomachy, and the uh, women are all Amazons in male armor, but only the white flesh characterizes them as women. Here one might even think of dress as a sort of deceit. Uh, it's the wrong dress for this body, so to speak. And, in com uh, and here, in this more generic Amazonomachy, we see the Amazon in this um, Eastern barbarian uh, bodysuit. In later depictions, such as on the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, these are the two pictures on the top, the naked breasts and legs during combat are not a sign of weakness and defeat, but of strength and aggressivity and erotic attraction, one might add. In contrast, if Contrast, if proper women are shown with their sexualized body parts, especially their genitals exposed, they are in a situation of extreme danger and vulnerability, such as the women being attacked by centaurs on the frieze from Basse on the bottom right. But nudity or nakedness did not only mark gender and ethnicity, it also defined age and class, again with vari variations according to context. Tomb beliefs show nude little boys standing upright with their mantle like ephebes, uh, like such as the little telecles here on the top right. They represent future citizens who died prematurely. But little naked boys in a crouching position are slaves, such as this one here on the left in the uh, grave relief from the Ilissos. He sits next to his master, a splendid youth, the deceased. The young man's old father, in contrast, appears dignified and completely wrapped in his hemation. Such a mantle also characterizes middle-aged citizens who nevertheless always retain a bit of nudity, leaving one shoulder and breast 
exposed, as you can see on the cup from Berlin here on the top, uh, on the bottom right, where men expect the work of craftsmen in a sculpture workshop. And uh, you can also see that the nudity of the citizens and of the craftsmen is um, handled in a different way. Naked women in public or in a semi-public venue, such as the symposium, are usually considered to be hetairai, so not proper women. I should mention that this iconographic rule has been questioned in recent years. I still find it the most convincing interpretation. And even if we cannot determine the social status of the women uh, depicted, I think the images make it clear that they do not correspond to the visual formula, formula for proper women. So they are either hetairai or a pictorial joke. I could continue with many more examples. What is important to recognize here is the general pattern that clearly distinguishes between nude and dressed people but that is simultaneously flexible enough to allow for a differentiation by degree. How about animals? According to the analogical model presented in Diogenes Laertius, in which animals are opposed to the Greek male citizen, one might assume that they too would have to be imagined as clothed, and that was correspond to what Protagoras says, even if for different reasons. Based on a similar anthropocentric and binary line of thought, but arguing less on a metaphorical level, Larissa Bonfante, in her Nudity as a Costume, states the opposite, quote, clothing distinguishes human society, civilized people, from animals and wild beasts which are naked. Humans wear clothes, animals do not, end quote. What do the images suggest? Let's have a look at dress. Indeed, animals, unlike in these beautiful uh, Egyptian uh, examples that we showed this morning, animals are never shown dress that is not clothed in garments produced by human technology. To certain mythological mixed creatures, however, and unsurprisingly, this rule does not always apply. The centaur Chiron, for example, often appears with the hemation covering the human upper part of his body here on the left side. This way, the wise teacher of Achilles stands out as the most civilized among his wild tribe, who usually display a naked human torso, just such as the fellow on the top right, sometimes with an animal hide around their arms. In conversation with Achilles' father Peleus, or with his pupil himself, Chiron almost appears as a dignified middle-aged Greek citizen. So these would be, again, the pictures on the left Achilles and um, Achilles, and here Chiron carrying Achilles on his hand. His iconography seems to confirm that civilized humans are covered by garments, whereas wild animals are not. On the other side, Chiron is a mixed creature. His monstrosity is all the more obvious in him wearing a hemation, which almost seems a form of disguise a disguise that tries to hide his human facade. It almost looks uh, as a bit, a bit of a clumsy or too obvious um, disguise in these depictions. Even more complicated is an example from the female world. A Lucanian red figure, Oinokoe, in Boston, here on the left side, depicts the transformed Ayo as a mixed creature. The body of a heifer is combined with the face of a woman with horns and animal ears. Scholars have always assumed that Ayo's head is covered here with a veil, a nuptial veil. Comparison with earlier depictions, however, that show Ayo in complete animal shape here on the right side, suggests the lines on the so-called veil could indicate folds of animal flesh rather than drapery. The veil would thus be part of the julep. Is the julep the animal equivalent of a veil? Or would the supposed veil indicate that Ayo has preserved some of her identity as a proper woman? Veils are ra rarely isolated pieces of cloth. Proper women usually cover their heads with a corner of their mantle. Is the cow's entire body, therefore, to be imagined as being wrapped in cloth? The ambivalence here is not only a clever way to represent the metamorphosis of a human into an animal, it simultaneously shows the flip side of an anthropomorphic image. The animal skin equals removable human female clothing, or the animal dress equals irremovable human female skin. In other words, the cow is as much anthropomorphized as Ayo is zoomorphized. This image, 
leads us to the next section of my paper, skin. As we have seen, Protagoras describes the advantages of how animals were equipped in the creation, but the image of clothing, he implies, reveals the limits of that anthropomorphic metaphor. Animals' natural clothing, hair, feathers, etc., covers their bodies, but is irremovable. That is, its wearer can never strip. Does this clothing therefore define the outside of the body more like natural skin than artificially produced dress? In other words, is animals' clothing equivalent to being naked? Or the other way around, is skin a cloth that, however, does not really cover or protect the body? Where does the bare body end and where does its envelope begin? Does the body have a clear boundary at all? And if not, can it actually be naked? It has often been pointed out that the body is actually not clearly delimited. Cultural historians and scientists alike see especially the skin as a membrane between inside and outside, between the living flesh, nerves, arteries, etc., and the dead substances such as hair or nails. And one would have, of course, uh, would have had to ask whether these are really dead hair and nails, uh, as long as they are in connection with the body and still growing. How is animal skin represented in Greek art? Depending on style or technique, animals' natural clothing, such as fur, feathers, or scales, is rendered in varying degree of detail. Dressed, protected, and naked or unprotected body parts are rarely distinguished. In black figure vase painting, for example, um, the, Nemean's, the Nemean lion's belly can be indicated by a white line, thus assimilating this unprotected, hairless, soft part of the body with female flesh. I'm talking about the image here on the left side that shows um, Heracles fighting with the Nemean lion. And this little line here on the body, uh, on the upper uh, lower side of the belly, indicates the unprotected part of the, uh, of the body. So one could think of this area as naked and then clothed by the fur, and the white assimilates this flesh to the female flesh of the woman to the side. If you want to get a better idea of how animal skin was imagined in relation to nudity, we have to look at images that confront or combine it with human bodies. I haven't done a systematic search, but it seems that, although there is no clear pattern, emphasis is on the homogeneous surface of both human and animal skin. When Heracles is fighting the Nemean lion, such as on the pictures here, the surface of both human and animal bodies is rendered in the same color, that is black with added red for hair or mane in uh, black figure vases and color of clay um, in the red figure vases. In this case here, there would be only a distinction in the way the hair of uh, the mane is indicated. Human male and animal body seem both naked or both naturally clothed. The bodies of mixed creatures, such as satyrs and centaurs, usually also show a homogeneous surface, at least in vase painting. They are either completely furry, such as here in this black figure, amphora, or show no hair at all on torso and legs. That would be the same here, the case for the uh, cup on the right side, and the same for centaurs, um, completely uh, like smooth surface for body and uh, human body and animal uh, part, actually also with this white line for the unprotected belly uh, area, and then uh, equally homogeneous in this red figure, uh, red figure vase. What about the animal skin as such when it is removed from the body? Is it just dead matter or does it retain something of its former content? Among the rare visual renderings related to the skinning of animals by humans is this man on a red figure vase who drags a hide behind him. Were it not for the tail in the man's hands, the animal hide would not be recognizable as such. This body, probably that of a bull or a cow, a domesticated animal, is indeed gone. It has been consumed, cut and cooked, we heard about sacrifice, in the context of sacrifice. And its skin could indeed be a lifeless piece of cloth that does not indicate anymore the form of the body it once enveloped. The situation is different with mythological figures who often feature skins or hides of wild felines or of deer. These undomesticated animals are also dead and gone, of course, but their hides sometimes retain something of the living bodies they once enclosed. 
On the metal piece of the south side of the Parthenon, for example, centaurs and lapids, so the humans against which they are fighting, fight each other in one-to-one -one battles. Although the centauromachy symbolized the struggle between chaos and order, civilization and barbarism, the images contradict such a clear opposition. Lapids and wild centaurs exhibit some similarities. Sometimes the latter are victorious, sometimes the former, as in the two metal pieces shown here. In addition, both the human and the mixed creature have beautiful, strong, and nude torsos. The heads are missing, and there you would have then seen some differences, but the torsos are uh, ultimately the same. The winner is in both cases shown with outstretched arms. A mantle covers the arms and the back of the lapith, here on the left side, similar to a curtain, and serves to emphasize the man's nude body. An animal skin, a panther or a lion skin, is hanging on the centaur's left arm in the other scene here on the right side, stretched out triumphantly and equally enhancing the nude human torso of the mixed creature. The skin as equivalent of the human's cloak is usually interpreted as a marker of the centaur's animality, similar to animal skins donned by satyrs or maenads. But as Daniela Widows has pointed out, the skin is not so much part of an animal body, and a dead one at that, then a hide, a product of human technology. After the animal had been killed, the skin was removed, stretched, tanned, etc. The final product sometimes left the original form of the un un animal unrecognizable. The living, natural clothing has become a dead artificial garment. On the metal piece shown here, it thus serves to point out the centaur's animality in conjunction with his human skills. And yet, the hide seems not entirely dead. Even if the original animal is not clearly identifiable, identifiable anymore, everything points to a feline cat. Legs and paws, head and tail have been preserved. The tail is floating to the left. Is this caused by the movement of the centaur? Or does the hide have a life of its own? The legs at least, and the scalp, as we see on the right side, which also should be moved by the air, hang down straight. At the same time, there is some activity going on. The claws are spread, the head seems to face the viewer or the corpse underneath. It stares at us or it stares at the corpse with empty eyes and impatient to dig its jaws into the body lying on the ground. Maybe the centaur's clenched fist indicates the strength he needs to hold the wildcat back. However we want to read the scene, the image clearly plays with that interstitial space between naked and dressed, animal and human, natural and artificial, alive and dead. Similarly, depictions of Heracles in his lion skin render it, the skin, as an in-between. We have already seen that there is no difference between human and animal body surface as long as the Nemean lion is alive. Once Heracles has killed the lion and skinned or stripped it, uh, was about to strip the beast, as in the slide you see here, the fur is indicated with dots or little strokes. Now it is distinguished from the hero's skin, similar to additional garment covering his body. But the depiction still gives the hide some agency. It seems to double the hero's actions, as for example with trailing tail, and spread claws while Heracles is fighting Gerioneus or Karma when he is dragging Cerberus away. The dead animal skin, modified and transformed by human technology, is still imagined in some way as belonging to and acting as a living animal. It seems not so much a natural clothing, which is dead, rather than a living, autonomous skin. Or, as if by osmosis, it has become the skin of the human it covers, in this case, Heracles. But the hero, hero himself is transformed, extracting strength from the processed animal skin, he has become a mixed creature himself. Now, is this skin naked? A look at human, a look at human bodies might be helpful here. Humans, after all, also have hair and nails. What distinguishes their skin from animal skin? Not only in pictorial representation, but also in reality, living human skin is also a product of human technology, as Murray Lee has recently made clear. From depilation to tanning, bathing, oiling, scraping, athletic training, or diet, 
only permanent and repeated body modification guaranteed a perfect male and female body. The nude human skin, in this sense, is also processed and a sort of dress. One might also say the naked skin is made nude or turned into a costume. In sum, the depictions of skin in conjunction, conjunction with social practices indicate that clear distinctions such as nude, clothed, alive, dead, natural, artificial, human, animal, are often foiled or leaking. They simultaneously establish dividing lines and they blur them. If a physical definition of naked versus dressed has proven to be difficult for animals, the last part of my presentation will ask whether the notion of shame Idos helps to distinguish nakedness from nudity. In other words, and going back to the beginning of my talk, does nudity, nakedness, in a moral sense, help distinguish humans from animals? Idos, such as DK, both installed by Zeus, can be considered a cultural or moral technology, which also serves to cover the body as a form of dress. Idos and the related concept of Sophrosyne are evident in movement and pose of a human body, whether dressed or naked. Control is especially important for the naked male body because exposure of one's genitals easily could appear as unrestrained behavior. Greek citizens who know to control their body, therefore, are depicted with a famously small penis or with an infibulated penis, such as the, the symposius on this crater or the poet Anacreon in the statue on the right that depicts him performing as if during the banquet. So this infibulation, uh, we think is a small ribbon that binds the foreskin back. How it really functioned is, uh, I think, not completely clear to us. The Greek word kinodesme, dog's leash, for the latter custom confirms that uncontrolled sexuality was understood as a characteristic of animals or animal-like behavior. Indeed, on many bases, sporting Dionysus and his wild entourage, animals and half-animal creatures, the satyrs, indulge into one of their favored and characteristic activities, namely displaying their enormous sexual organs. Wild satyrs satisfy themselves in sexual intercourse with different or activities with different animals, mainly deer or donkeys. This way, the satyrs, by some believe to be the fruit of bestial love, reveal their bestiality in double respect. Sometimes the animal wants to take action with dubious success, as shown on this drinking cup from Naples on the bottom. In approaching a naked woman, probably a minot, a mule takes the place of the satyr. You can compare the image to the one uh, from the German private collection here on the top right. No wonder, finally, that the male sexual organ itself can take on the form of an animal as in the case of these phallus birds here on the top, or a phallus mule or horse on the bottom right. Animals, one might then conclude, animals were, unlike humans, actually imagined naked by nature. They are lacking any sense of shame. The pictures even suggest that the animals are deliberately displaying their shamelessness. In that, however, the animals resemble the half-human creatures, satyrs, who we think are stand-ins for the humans, because they are assimilated to half humans, acting out their lewdness or animality, animals seem anthropomorphized to a certain extent here. In the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, it is almost exclusively the imagery on sympotic vessels that renders animals engaged in sexual activities. And the animals that populate these scenes are usually donkeys, mules, or deer, Dionysiac animals by, excellen by excellence. That seems to indicate that shameless exposure was not necessarily imagined as characteristic of animals. This is confirmed by the fact that depictions of sexual intercourse between animals themselves are extremely rare, in particular if you compare them to the number of depictions of sexual intercourse between humans. When animals are portrayed in a public context, so if you look at votive statues, grave reliefs, or depictions of animals in scenes of war, processions, etc., I just pick out two examples here, they seem controlled. There is no specific emphasis on their genitals. Um, another scene here, the Parthenon frieze with these riders, where it's, uh, the, the 
artists have made sure to make these horses overlap uh, and also the feet overlap sometimes and just uh, hide or conceal uh, the, uh, the sexual organs of the, uh, of the animals. In sacrificial processions, the genitals or secondary sexual characteristics such as udder and teeth here on the left can help identify and appreciate the sacrificial victim, but they are usually not emphasized. Often, the genitals are covered by the human participants of the procession walking next to the animals, as here on the Parthenon. In all these cases, then, and appropriate for the occasion, it seems that the animals are imagined nude rather than naked. So again, here, the covered humans also cover, in most cases, the uh, sexual organs of the animals. As the context made clear, the animals behave like the humans they accompany. Lewdness characterizes Dionysiac scenes, whereas in battle scenes or sacrificial processions, or these uh, riders, yeah, or sacrificial processions, human and animal participants display the appropriate amount of shame. At first sight, this confirms that animals are constantly anthropomorphized, but images of bestial sexual behavior can turn this assumption on its head. If it's half humans that make animals act out their sexuality, who imposes one sense of shame in the scenes of sacrificial procession? The uncovered animals or the humans that are wrapped in their mantles? I conclude, are animals naked? As explained at the beginning of my talk, the very question seems misguided because it classifies and describes animals in human terms. A metaphor taken from the human world, clothing for the Greeks marks the anthropological difference, but not as one would expect it to do. As we read in Plato's Protagoras and Aristotle, animals are not naked because they are uncivilized, but on the contrary, they are by nature clothed because they lack the skills to provide for themselves. The anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism that permeates the texts also rules Greek imagery of the 6th and 5th centuries BCE with its differentiation between unclothed and clothed figures as visual equivalents for those possessing logos and those lacking it. But the images complicate the model. Not only do they differentiate by degree, yeah, age, class, gender, etc., but they also can turn it on its head as a closer look at depictions of garment, skin, and genitals can show. Nudity and nakedness inhabit that interstitial space between the body and its cloth, between bare skin and its shaped and trimmed surface. Animal behavior, in addition, often corresponds to that of the human companions. Who is imitating whom here? The guiding anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism of my initial question cannot completely keep up. But the question, therefore, th and the question, therefore, cannot be answered unequivocally. In Greek imagination, animals can be clothed, nude, or naked. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandretta. And now I invite Patricia Johnson to come and respond. Thank you. Thanks to Annetta for a terrific paper and such wonderful images, very wide ranging um, and uh, a wide ranging conclusion. So I'm going to be selective in my brief comments today. And I apologize because I'm going to open with a tangent, although I think you'll find it a relevant one and also funny, which is always good. Here we go. Couture Dogs of New York. I cannot see how to do the slideshow. Here we go. So up in Boston, we heard there was another event happening in New York City this week called Fashion Week. And one event, in fact, the kickoff event at the Hotel Pennsylvania last Friday was something called the New York Pet Fashion Show. Uh, this, uh, the person who designed this cover of Couture Dogs of New York uh, actually won the prize for best design. Um, clearly, Protagoras and Aristotle's notions that animals were born with sufficient clothing 
has not yet found purchase in New York City. Um, this was confirmed this morning with various dogs with boots on running around Washington Square Park. Uh, the theme of the show was uh, crown jewels of fashion and rescue. Uh, it's a benefit, actually, for animal rescue. Um, so here we have a little king of sorts. I guess this one was another kind of a king. Uh, but as you can see, there's a princess of some kind. Uh, these, uh, <laughs> there's cultural and class markers everywhere in evidence in this dressing of dogs. And as you say, anthropomorphism is not dead. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, one more timely, I think, slide uh, returning to the ancient world, at least to my part of it, uh, which I hope you can see here, uh, is a manuscript illustration uh, depicting Ascanius killing the stag of Sylvia from Aeneid Book 7, um, here sporting a very handsome collar. Uh, uh, so an indication of the association of animals and clothing being clearly uh, domestication and a reduction of their wildness. So two separate issues raised by Annetta's paper um, uh, intrigued me as they intrigued her and are going to frame my comments here from my outsider position as a Latin poetry person. Um, first is this definitional problem of naked and nude, which I actually find pretty interesting. Um, I think it's important to underscore that there's a distinction between the representation of an unclothed human being in an artistic medium, um, uh, in art and literature, as opposed to other settings, let's call it Derrida's shower. Um, Within an artistic medium like literature or fine art, it seems to me that the term naked importantly describes loss, absence, something stripped away or removed, as Annette's notes on the frieze at Basai uh, mentioned, and especially vulnerability. So in this context, the term naked wouldn't seem to me to properly refer to animals at all, apart from the hairless chihuahua and apart from the vulnerable animal. Um, and then, of course, there's the erotic stuff. Um, I hadn't seen your slides uh, before today, and, and that, was, uh, uh, that was a key part of your argument, obviously. Uh, so animals can be dressed, but they're not technically naked without their getup. They're simply unclothed. The term nude, by contrast, is interesting. Uh, it implies intention, an undressing, and then a display, a process of objectification, and would therefore remove, I think, refer to most artistic representations of human beings without clothing. I would, for example, or we would uh, not describe a, the, a so-called uh, Renaissance nude as a Renaissance naked, um, uh, any more than we would use the ter term the nude truth. Uh, in the former example, naked doesn't capture the fact of intentional representation of the uncovered body in art for art, erotic or whatever purposes. In the latter example, um, in the latter metaphor of the nude truth, the nude does not capture the stripping away, the exposure, the removal that we're trying to convey with the term the naked truth. I think the contrast can be seen in artistic subjects that are deliberately depicted as naked and therefore vulnerable, naked, not nude, and therefore vulnerable. And I'm really pulling one out of a hat because this is not my area, but uh, this has always been a striking image to me from Trajan's column of the Roman prisoners who are being tormented. I guess they're pulling, the Dacian women are pulling their hair. Um, they are portrayed naked, I think, even though their body type um, is extremely attractive and nude. It's their vulnerability, their status of prisoners that's being emphasized by their lack of clothing. I like it because they are attractive as sculptural nudes, but the loss of clothing and vulnerability are key to the representation. Elsewhere on the column, Roman soldiers are dressed. By contrast, in Larissa Bonfante's formulation that Annetta mentioned, in artworks, nudity as opposed to nakedness can act as a kind of costume. 
Um, and again, I'm pulling an extreme example. This is what non-art historians can do. They can pull the most extreme examples and let everybody argue about them. Um, are these extremely interesting? Um, uh, first century AD Flavian matron sculptures, funerary sculptures. Um, I refer you to the chapter by Yves D'Ambra in Campen's Ancient Art, uh, Ancient, or Sexuality in Ancient Art. Um, as you can see, the portrait heads of not exactly young matrons are pretty well marked as either middle-aged or older in their, uh, the composition of their faces and the realism of their faces have been incongruously placed on the body of Aphrodite of Knidos, um, which is worn as a kind of funerary costume for the recipient, which would be the person who's being honored in, in death. Um, and I assume that this is sort of okay, uh, made okay by the fact that everybody knows that this is the Aphrodite of Canidos, so would they know that the matron's body is not being exposed and therefore it's acceptable as a public or you know, public artwork. Yeah. So those are just a few thoughts on naked and nude. Um, a second intriguing issue that Annette's paper raises is this question of an in initial principles about the relationship between the species, the Aristotle-Pythagoras question. And here's where I'm gonna go rather far afield into the Roman world and into the world of literature. Uh, because in the Metamorphoses, Ovid is of course fascinated by and has a field day with the dividing lines between human and animal, and especially the idea of post-metamorphosis residue. Ovid does not exactly subscribe to all of the pitfalls of human exceptionalism that Craig Williams describes at the beginning of his recent article on human-animal relationships that I'm sure we'll hear more about today. But the Ovidian view of the world's inhabitants as opposed to Diogenes Laertius, so I have some reservations about using the Diogenes Laertius, is firmly tripartite, not dyadic. And among... Um, uh, the non-human, I mean, it's human, divine, and other, and in the other category are both animals and vegetation. Um, and of course, for Ovid, the boundaries are there to highlight their porousness, but they are there, and it's very important that they stand in order for that porousness to be uh, exemplified and exemplary, actually. Um, and so Ovid explores the character of these on different levels, including ideas of nudity and nakedness. So Daphne, in book one of the Metamorphoses, is twice described as nuda during her flight from Apollo. Here, I think, to be translated nude, introduced as it is, I mean, not so much its presence in a literary work, but introduced as it is by observation and erotic attraction. Uh, she is called Nuda by Apollo, who's in love with her and watching her weed et spectat, visa decens auta forma fugast. Um, she is, he looks at her, he sees her. She looks lovely. Her beauty is increased by her flight. Um, these are all from the uh, point of view of Apollo, and so I think that she is, it is nudity, because uh, he's observing it. Her naked, naked legs, her nudos lacertos, are admired by Apollo in line 500. But as she flees, we see a shift from nude to naked. And this, I think, is a deliberate one Ovid is pursuing as her fear and her vulnerability increase and marked at an important moment in the text by the simile of the hunted animal, um, which is one of the most frightening similes, really, in all of ancient literature, where she can feel... Um, Apollo's breath on her neck, the way that an animal being chased by a Gallic hound feels the nuzzle just touching, just touching, but not quite gra uh, reaching uh, to grab. It's an amazing simile, wonderful. That's at 523 and following. <clears throat> also, the breeze at 527 makes her body naked, nudabant corpora venti. Uh, by blowing her garments against her skin, which Ovid describes. <clears throat> In her final prayer to her father, Daphne asks her father to change not her beauty, as it is often translated, but her figura, 
that wonderful porous word from the realms of art, literature, rhetoric, and grammar, um, all combined in Latin. Ovid never uses it carelessly. She asks him to change her type almost. And this is one of the things that people have often thought was strange. She asks, I mean, they, because they, if they translate figura as beauty, the one thing that remains is her nitor, is something that's very closely associated with beauty. And so people say, what is Ovid up to? I don't think Ovid says uh, that she asks that her beauty be changed. I think she asks that her species type be changed, that her shape, her form, her grammatical construction, um, all those wonderful ideas coming into it. I think that's what she's asking to be changed. And that's exactly what, in fact, he does. From human being to tree to vegetation. Daphne feels herself becoming surrounded or girt. Uh, Kingere is tellingly a verb for strapping on protective armor by soft bark, molia um, kinguntur praecordia. Her hair becomes frondes, leaves, her arms, ramos, branches. Leave it to Ovid that he chooses two of his favorite metaphors for leaves and branches, crinais and brachia, to describe Daphne's arms and legs before the transformation. We just have this wonderful sort of mixing um, uh, of a, uh, saying through in the world of metaphor, what is the difference between these categories? In my world, there's really, the, the categories are there, but everything is moving across those lines all the time. The metaphor announces the boundary violation without challenging the fact of the boundary. In fact, the boundary is reconfirmed by that violation. In her transformation, Daphne loses her nudity, viewed from the point of view of Apollo, who is strongly attracted, and her nakedness, viewed from her own and her father's point of view as the vulnerability she's experiencing. And so, in this dynamic, it is a most perfect metamorphosis. All that remains of the old Daphne, visually speaking, is the nitor, um, which is associated with beauty, some kind of gleamy beauty. But much of her humanity remains within. Apollo embraces her as if she's still human. She still has a beating heart. She shrinks from Apollo's kisses. And she seems at the end of the episode to approve her appalling double appropriation by both Apollo and Augustus by nodding her treetop. In other words, Ovid imagines her still as a human agent um, post-metamorphosis. <clears throat> Io is the one, really, the most striking, though, example um, in the metamorphoses and brings us back to the question of the animal world. Um, Jupiter sets up the animal and vegetation slash human slash divine triangle in his lame attempt at a seduction speech in Book 1 in 589 and following by suggesting that Io enter the woods to escape the hot noonday sun, where, because she will be a vulnerable human being, will be protected from the wild beasts, so wild beast forest associated by his divinity. So he sets that triangle up right at the beginning. The irony, of course, is that she has much more to fear from the divine protector in this triangle than she does from wild beasts or from trees, for that matter. Having raped her, Jupiter transforms her into a cow to hide her from Juno, a domestic animal. Io is still beautiful after her transformation like Daphne was. But more important, her metamorphosis is also complete like da incomplete like Daphne's. As Annette's example from Greece also seems to acknowledge um, the cow with a woman's face. I love that. It's a wonderful example. To Io in Ovid's text, the bovine diet tastes bitter. Argus's chain around her neck is unworthy of her. The ground is a hard bed. The drinking water is muddy. All of these things being purely human observations about her uh, new environment. She wants to appeal to Argus, who is following her around as a suppliant, but is frustrated because she has no brachia to extend to him in the suppliant posture. She speak, wants to speak, but she can only moo. When she hears or sees herself in the water, she becomes terrified. 
So she does not identify with this thing that she's become. Luckily for the narrative and for Io herself, Io is literate and therefore was able to write her entire story in the sand with her hoof for her father and sisters to read. And so they learn what has happened to her. <laughs> that, that classic Ovidian <laughs> twist. Um, but despite all of this detail about Io's anxious emotions, she never talks about feeling naked. She's wearing a costume. She's petrified. She feels she's stuck in this costume, of course, but she doesn't talk about feeling naked. So Ovid's metamorphosed characters are a type of meditation on the differences between us and them, the boundaries between animals, plants, humans, and gods, which I think in Ovid are rigid, but porous, if that makes sense. Aneta's uh, Io and Oinokoe is a visual expression of the same idea exercised so energetically in Ovid's text. There was still a human being, human thought, and human anxiety within the body of a cow. The heifer body is more of a costume. Unlike the case, and this is my final case from um, Ovid, uh, poor Marcius, the satyr, um, who is uh, uh, skinned alive by Apollo, either as punishment for challenging Apollo to a contest or as punishment for winning a music contest, um, this uh, uh, representation accompanied by a host of gruesome detail in the, in the book as well. Here, Apollo calmly, methodically removing the skin of Marcius um, as though a surgeon. Um, this story appears in Metamorphoses 6. Marcius's cry as he is skinned alive has proved puzzling to commentators but I think becomes clear in the context of what we're talking about at this conference. He says, quid, quid me mihi de trahis? Why are you tearing me away from myself? Um, and, and most people don't really have much of an explanation for this. Setting aside Ovid's ongoing concern with punishment of artists and free expression, um, and this is not just my thing, it's also Marcius's statue is set up as a, a symbol of libertas in the Roman Forum. Um, uh, where the assemblies met and, and of Parasia, Libertas and Parasia. Um, so Marcius is that, does denote that in the Roman context. But setting that aside for a second, it seems that Ovid is again addressing the relationship of skin, um, sometimes a costume, but sometimes a core part of identity. And here, clearly not a costume that can be removed. <clears throat> Finally, the speech of Pythagoras in Book 15 and its diatribe against the slaughter of animals is clearly worth another look in this context of what we're talking about at this conference. While Pythagoras provides reincarnation as the rationale for his view that animals should not be eaten, human souls may lurk within. A very human exceptionalist indeed, it's okay to kill animals and eat them unless there are human souls inside them. Um, Ovid has just spent 14 books of the Metamorphoses demonstrating that almost anything can dwell within an animal form. Transform human, human beings, nymphs, gods, and even within plant forms. So I guess the final message from him is be careful what you eat. Thank you, Annetta.